This is an extended video on Jane Eyre, quotations that she says about herself. I've done a separate video on quotations that other characters say about her. So we're going to go through the beginning, middle and end of the text again to make sure that you've got a full coverage of how she as a character develops. So to start at the beginning, um, she says, I'm humbled by the consciousness of my physical inferiority in chapter one. She knows that she is physically weaker than her cousins. Much is made of Jane's petite size throughout the novel, but that is emphasised right from the start. She also refers to herself as the scapegoat of the nursery. I mean, this is slight animal imagery as well. I speak extensively about the animal imagery that other characters use about her in my other video. She knows that her cousins ensure that she is blamed for things that aren't necessarily her fault. And actually, the servants and definitely her aunt are more than willing to blame her for things as well. She says in chapter four, I cried out in a savage, high voice. So whilst other characters talk about Jane being wild and savage, she also uses that language to describe herself. She recognises the passion within herself. If we move to the middle of the text, uh, she says, Women are supposed to be very calm generally, but women feel just as men feel. That's in chapter 12. Uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, I like this text that Bronte doesn't make Jane have to entirely conform to what society would expect. She relishes that this character has got intense feelings um, and there isn't a complete apology for that. Jane occasionally has to learn to rein them in, but she is still allowed to feel passionately throughout this text. She says, in those days I was young, and all sorts of fancies, bright and dark, tenanted my mind. So that is refer that's in chapter 12. That is referring to the complexity of the feelings and thoughts that Jane grapples with throughout the book. With reference to Mr. Rochester, uh, theirs is a very complex dynamic. They toy with each other in a way that we wouldn't necessarily consider as healthy. She says, I knew the pleasure of vexing and soothing him by turns. It was one I chiefly delighted in. So Jane learns fairly early on how to push Rochester's buttons and she enjoys the power that that allows her. Like I've said, he also toys with her too. <laughs> Very deceitfully in several places. She says about herself, this is when she goes back to visit her Aunt Reed when Aunt Reed is nearly dead just before she dies in chapter 21. She says, I'm passionate but not vindictive. So again, this is referring to the strength of her feelings. Yes, she is passionate, but that is not to say that she is cruel, she's not unkind, she's not horrible, as her Aunt Reed has often made her feel. Now, this is one of the most famous quotes from the book and um, possibly my favourite like I said, lots of animal imagery has been directed at her. She says, I am no bird and no net ensnares me. I am a free human being with an independent will. And again, this is celebrating the strength of her character. She is refusing to be caught or pinned down by society and what is necessarily expected of her. Here, she, um, after she cannot marry Rochester, she talks about herself in third person. She says, Jane Eyre, who had been an ardent, expectant woman, almost a bride, was a cold, solitary girl again. Her life was pale, her, prospect, her prospects were desolate. So this is talking about the lack of hope that she's feeling. She thought that she was like an adult woman, that she was going to step into this role as Rochester's wife. That's been taken away from her and she's feeling like this hopeless child that she felt she was both at Gateshead and certainly at the start of her time at Lowood as well. She feels like everything has been lost to her and she's got no hope in the world. This is another excellent quote, nice and short, easy to learn. I care for myself, I will respect myself. So she refuses to become Rochester's, 
Rochester's mistress. She knows that that would be degrading herself and kind of throwing away uh, who she really is and she refuses to do it and obviously eventually she gets rewarded for that at the end of the book. When she leaves um, Thornfield and she leaves her only money or jewellery in the carriage, she says, I'm alone, I'm absolutely destitute. And this is showing us as a reader the level to which she's been degraded. I mean, we see her for a couple of days, she's begging, she's starving, she nearly dies. So we're seeing the dryness of her situation and she realises that herself. And she says in chapter 28, she talks about her sad heart, impotent as a bird with its wings broken. So she's not calling herself a bird there, but she's saying her, it's like her heart has been well, broken to an extent. It can no longer fly. To move towards the end of the book, um, when she stands up to Saint-Jean, she doesn't give in to his desires. He wants to marry her, to take her to be a missionary's wife, just because he thinks she'll be great at it, not because he loves her. And she says he had not imagined that a woman would dare to speak so to a man. Obviously, Rochester has always previously relished Jane uh, being like his intellectual equal, being able to spar with him verbally to talk about ideas. San John doesn't relish that in the same way, but he doesn't love, or he doesn't love Jane at all, but he certainly doesn't love or see the real her in the way that Rochester does. She again talks about herself in third person when she's reunited with Rochester at the end. And she says, she is all here, her heart too, which is telling him that she's not this creature of the other world that he fears that she might be. He thinks he might be imagining her. And we've had that supernatural element of them hearing each other's voices. She's saying that everything about her is with him, including her heart, that all of her belongs to him. She loves him entirely. Um, one of the slightly interesting quotes that I've picked out towards the end is, I love you better now when I can be really useful to you. This is said to Rochester in chapter 37, and I think it has, has a sort of tinge of Munchenhausen syndrome. So she's saying because you're blind and because you're not, you don't have necessarily the physical strength you used to have, I love you even more because I get to take care of you which uh, in a way is slightly creepy. I mean, I think it's meant to sh demonstrate how much she loves him, but it's saying, yeah, I like that you're slightly vulnerable because I can look after you and it's giving her an increased power as well. So it's showing the complex dynamics of Rochester and Jane's relationship right at the very end as well. Uh, but she does also say in chapter 38, no one was ever nearer to her mate than I am, ever more absolutely bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh which is suggesting that all of her is Rochester's. Every single part of her belongs to him. She couldn't love him with any more of her being. It's a very strong quotation. And I'm going to end on that one. <laughs>